Turn with me in the Bible, if you would, to Ephesians 6. A week or two, well, actually it was several weeks ago now, I preached out of the second half of Ephesians 5. We've been looking at practical ways in which, and they're wonderfully given to us here by the Apostle Paul, we can live out the cry of John the Baptist from John 3.30. He, meaning Christ, must increase and I must decrease. Or another way of thinking about it, as we read out of that passage from Matthew, the master himself says to everyone who would follow him that if you're going to follow me and be genuine about it, and it's going to be real, and it's going to be effective and powerful and transformative in your life, here's what it looks like. You deny yourself. You pick up your cross, and you follow me. That this life, this earthly life that so many people cling to, think is so important, indeed think that all that is, there is to, to have or, or all that is worth having, you're going to have to lose that. You're going to have to leave it behind. You're going to have to, as he told that one young man, you're going to have to let the dead bury the dead. You have to leave everything, deny yourself, get rid of this life. And you know what? That's all right because, as it turns out, this life is not only a vapor that is passing in here one moment, but it is sinful and dark, and it is a chain. So Christ is actually saying, lay down your burdens. They're just dragging you down. Pick up mine. I give you newness of life, and follow me. It's all about denying ourselves. Well, that's great. How do we actually do that, though? So that is what has brought us to Ephesians. And a number of weeks ago, there are some, admittedly, now we're talking practical applications, yes? We're, we're, we're moving, there's theological truths behind all of it, but now we're into actual practicing. How does the rubber hit the road in my life? How do I deny myself daily? What does it look like to pick up my cross beyond the metaphor of submission and humiliation and following and making little of this world and much of the next? What does that realistically look like? And I, I think that you have begun to notice when we get beyond just the thinking and the the theology and get right down to the nitty gritty of Christian living, it is contentious. It's contentious because when we get down into the dirt of life and how we live it, the call is to live like Christ. And that naturally puts us in opposition to a world that is dark and God-hating and for the moment ruled by Satan. So the more we endeavor to practically and effectively live out the calling to which all of Christ's disciples are called, the more contention we find. Now, it's not contention, I note this morning, it's not contention between ourselves and the Bible's teaching. If we're struggling with any of this, if we're saying, I don't know if I can practically do that in my marriage, in my family, in my workplace, we'll see this morning, or in my, my own thoughts, in my partnerships, in my whatever my circumstances may be, that's going to be very difficult. Yes, good. Following Christ, living for Christ, being the church, being the light of the world that is dark, is innately countercultural. That's where the contention comes in. It's not a fight between ourselves and what the Word of God calls us to live and do and be. It is a contention between a world that is pressing upon us at every possible point with the opposite message. Oh, your marriage is called to look like this? No, it should look like this. We have to stand fast. Oh, let your children run wild and free. No, we're to train them in discipline. The culture wants to give you the opposite message, and it is unrelenting. We'll see next week the reason it is unrelenting is because this is one of the ways in which Satan attacks God's people constantly, unceasingly, with a siren call saying, don't follow Christ, do this. Listen to your heart, listen to the flesh, follow the culture, don't make waves. This morning we come, I thought we had come to some very contentious passages in this regard, 
where the culture is saying one thing, society is saying one thing, and here is the call for Christians. I thought we had come to some contentious things before. As I have been, uh, and I'll, I'll admit it, struggling. I struggled more with these verses this week than I did with anything about wives, husbands, children, or parents. Let's take a look at the text, and then maybe you'll start to understand why. And I will, with God's help, do my best to unpack this for you this morning, all right? Ephesians 6, starting at verse 5. Bond servants, here in the ESV translation. Bond servants, obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling, with a sincere heart, as you would Christ. Not by the way of eye service, as people pleasers, but as bond servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, rendering service with a good will as to the Lord and not to man, knowing that whatever good anyone does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is a bond servant or is free. Masters, do the same to them and stop your threatening knowing that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven and that there is no partiality with him. Lord, that is a blessing to that reading, our understanding of it, and yes, in my preaching of it. What we're looking at here, when it would have originally arrived at the church in Ephesus, then been copied and sent off to the next local church down the road, that's how these letters were originally received, and it's very important that we keep that in mind. This is a largely illiterate world. So let me paint you a bit of a picture. Let's go back to millennia. You're members of the church at Ephesus. It's a large, very prosperous church. It's standing fast. Uh, We know from its personal letter from Christ in Revelation 2, it's standing fast against false teachers and their teachings. It's holding fast to orthodoxy. It's a large, prosperous, gospel-centered, we would say, church. It's thriving. And one day, a letter arrives from it. By the way, Timothy, at this point in time, is probably your pastor. You're, one, you're planted by Paul. Your pastor is one step. He's the protege of the Apostle Paul. You've got a lot to smile and pat yourself on the back about. And then one day, a letter arrives. Oh, well, we have a, received a letter from the Apostle Paul. Wonderful, wonderful. But most of you can't read the letter. Maybe a small handful of you have training on how to read Konye Greek. So what happens is that the letter arrives, we have our fellowship meal, our love feast, we gather together then, and the letter is read. It's read. Very much the way I'm standing up here doing all the reading and talking and explaining, that would have been very much what would have happened when this letter first arrived. So keep in mind, as we work our way through this and through all of the epistles, that when Paul calls out specific subgroups or people or categories, they're sitting right there. When he says that we are to submit to one another, halfway through chapter 5, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, and then goes on to explain what does that look like, wives, there's a room full of wives. Husbands, there's husbands sitting there. You don't get off the hook either. Children, there are children gathered around, probably playing and making a mess, and then parents have to grab them and go, listen, Paul wrote this part for you. There's parents there. When he calls out specific names, either in the beginnings or sometimes in the middle, often at the ends, where he gives all the, the personal greetings, those people are there. Why is that important for our study and understanding of this contentious and difficult passage? Well, take a look at verse 5, if you would. Bond servants. It's now in the ESV. This has a little footnote next to mine. And let's start with a bit of Greek this morning. The word that we translate bond servant, uh, or if you're still using the, the, the KGV or, or something else of, of that era, um, you may just have servants. This word in Greek is doulos, all right? It is doulos. It is slave. It is slave. So please read this as slaves. Obey your earthly masters with fear and trembling with a sincere heart. There are slaves in the congregation of the church the morning this is read, the evening this is read. Right? Just as he calls out wives and husbands and children, there are slaves. That is, there are people in our church here in Casting our minds back to first century Ephesus or wherever we may find ourselves, there are people who are owned by other people. 
There are people in our church family, in our congregation, who are redeemed, regenerate, born again, followers of Christ, dreaming of their inheritance that is to come when they throw off this earthly tent and are garbed in their permanent, not made with human hands, resurrection body, all the aspects of the Christian faith, and yet here and now they have no rights. Here and now, gathered among us, they are property. They are, as the Romans would say, talking tools. And so here comes a letter from the Apostle Paul saying, are you owned by someone? Do you have a master, an earthly master? Obey them. By the way, masters, same dynamic. You don't get off the hook. You are also called to do the same to them. And you say, what is that? Well, Paul's just kind of saving some ink here. He's saying, treat your slaves as brothers in Christ, not property, not chattel, not talking tools. Is it talking tools? What is that about? See, as we've been looking at all of the component parts of this, this is absolutely countercultural. But we're so far removed from it now that a little bit of explanation, I think, will help clarify and put it in its place. This is part of the same household code that comes to us because the Greco-Roman first century household had all of these parts. It had a married couple. Husband, wife, it had children. Uh, in fact, later on around this time, uh, good Roman wives are required by law to provide at least three healthy children. So that we can, I told you earlier, she, her whole purpose is just to make more Romans. So every household has a wife, every household has a husband, every household has children, every household has slaves. How they are treated differs on the master but every household has them. So when Paul comes to this section and he's describing, here's what the Christian household and all its component parts look like. This is just a part of that household. It's also important for us to realize that in first century Greco-Roman world, this is not a moral issue, all right? We are two millennia removed from this. We look at this and go, I don't, and many, many skeptics look at this and go, here's where I walk away. The Bible condones slavery. I'm going to show you in a moment that it absolutely does not. But they will look at this, maybe even we look at this. This is why I say I've had more struggle with this than I did with husbands and wives. What do we do about slaves? Because there's no beating around. Now, why do we have bond servants? Well, the, the writers of the ESV, and I actually went and read the introduction of my Bible, um, they chose, instead of saying servants, which doesn't really fit, we think servants, we think maids and butlers, and that's not reflective of what the reality was. A bond servant was something in antiquity. It is a slave, but you at least have the outside chance of someday being free. So they put that there because in Roman society, slaves couldn't, I mean, your odds were probably better at winning the lottery, but slaves could become free. There was a, a provision in Roman law, it was called manumission, uh, literally handing off. And if for whatever reason, a slave owner, a master, said, I want this slave to be free, they found a witness, usually one of the government officials, and the slave owner lays hands on him and then turns him away, he literally grabs him by the arm and then spins him around and pushes him out, and somebody witnesses that, and that person is no longer property, that person is a freed man. A free man. This is countercultural because it's not a moral issue in first century Ephesus, Colossae, wherever this letter may have showed up. We need to be very clear on that. Every household has slaves. Some more affluent households, I mean, if you're of the very poor, you may only own one or two people. If you're very affluent, you may own hundreds. We, we actually have a, an anecdote from this time period where a slave murdered his master. And in order to put down the rebellion, all of the slaves in his household were killed. Uh, one of you did that, we'll punish all of you. And the number of slaves that were killed in retribution was 400. So his households could have enormous numbers of slaves. What was this slavery like? Well, as I said, the Roman term is actually talking 
tools. Slaves have no rights. They are not even really people in this setting, in this time. In fact, the reason that they had to be in rebellion and, and, uh, and all that slave masters felt that they had to be so heavy-handed with them is because there were so many of them. The population of slaves in Italy in this time period was at least 33 percent. One-third of every person you met in the street was a slave. That died off a little bit empire-wide. It goes down to about 20 percent, one in five. I have this quote from Kay Bradley, who has studied the history of Roman slavery quite extensively. He says simply this, quote, freedom was not a general right, but a select privilege, close quote. That is the vast difference between 21st century contemporary Canada and first century Roman Empire. We look at this and go, well, what about the freedom of the individual? It's not right that you should own someone. It wasn't even a concept in Rome. And if you were a church in the middle of this, that's going to color and affect and severely limit what you're able to do. People often say, well, why didn't the Apostle Paul call for slaves to be freed? Well, he did. I'll show you that. He did. But honestly, that's not the Bible's focus. I, t I told you, I'm going to get into hot water and contention, all right? The Bible's is not a social political manifesto. And Paul is not writing such here. He is writing to renewed, regenerated, saved, born-again disciples following Christ, those who were in the world but are now have been taken out of it. That's the focus. The focus of the Bible is the gospel. Political, societal change stems out of that but is not the primary focus of it. It's not the primary focus of the Bible as a whole, which is to give us the story of salvation and redemption through Christ back to God. And it's not the focus here. It's tangential. All right. So let's come to this text. And maybe that will try to understand, color it, and, and put it in its, uh, in its proper place here. So slaves, because there are slaves among you. There are those here that are owned by other people. Paul does not then go into, well, you're in Christ now. You should be free. Masters free your slaves. Appears nowhere. Not, not specifically. I'll put an asterisk on that. But instead, he acknowledges the reality of the world in which Christians live. You see that? Some of you are slaves. Okay. If that's my reality, and I'm a Christian... How do I walk this walk? How do these two seemingly contrasting things play out in my life? How do I, as a talking tool, as a piece of property with no rights under Roman law, I mean, my master is free to beat, abuse, perhaps oh, it was a little frowned on because it was really destruction of property, but even murder me. How does that play out? How do I be a Christian and that's my lot in life? Paul says simply, embrace it for Christ. Obey your earthly masters, yes, with fear and trembling. That is, I am not here, I am not writing to foster rebellion amongst the 20 to 33 percent of you. We are not, and this is, this is very a message that is very apropos for our day and time, we as Christians are not social revolutionaries. We do not wave flags and take to the streets and hold up placards and set fire to buildings and overturn cars and say that we've got to tear this whole thing down and build it better. That is not our calling. And there are many, many voices out there, garbed in Christian garb, who want to tell you that it is. No, that is not the church. If it was, we'd see it here. Instead, slaves, obey your masters. He acknowledges, yes, you're in slavery. You have masters. You have earthly masters. But instead of fostering rebellion and overturning society, here's how you live in your state, in your lot. Here's how you live exemplifying Christ, through submission and joyful obedience. Just like I told the wives, just like I told the husbands, just like the children are called to, 
just as the parents are called to. See, all of these stem out of 521, go up a page. 521, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what the church is called to do, and all the people in it are called to do. Submitting to one another, why? Out of reverence for Christ. Here are some specific examples. Wives, husbands, children, parents, slaves, slave owners and masters, heads of households. How do I walk and exemplify Christ in newness of life? And Paul says it's not by lighting fires, it's not by storming out, it's not even by violent revolution, it's by obeying with a sincere heart as you would Christ. And this reminder, you are a slave, here's this word again in verse 6, you are a slave of Christ. Oh, and masters, so are you. Flip over to... 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7, or make, it, make a note of it, but if, if you've got your Bible there, flip back several pages. Because Paul is saying, here's the theological reality that helps you walk this walk. We're all slaves. Paul, several times in addressing his letters, says, and again, it's translated often servant. Paul, a, a servant and apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's doulos, it's slave. And in fact, at one point in his letters, Paul actually uses a word that translates into under rower, which is the, remember, galleys would be oared by slaves. They'd be chained to an oar. And some ships, if they were particularly large, would have banks of oars. You'd have one level and two level and thir three levels. He describes himself as a third level galley slave. I'm the guy in the basement of the ship, chained to an oar, pulling it, never seeing the light of day ever again until I die. That's me. That's how much I humble myself. He describes himself as not just a slave, but an under rower. And also all are you. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 21. Here's this little paragraph within a paragraph. Actually, verse 20. Uh, where each one of you should remain in the condition in which he was called. Let me read that again. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Are you a husband and you come to salvation and faith in Christ? Then remain a husband. He's already talked about this. It was a question that had come up in Corinth. If I'm in a marriage and we're both unbelievers and then I become a believer, should I dump my spouse? And the answer is clearly no. And vice versa for wives. This would also apply to slave owners and slaves. Well, now that I'm a Christian, should I overthrow the shackles of my oppressors? Each one of you should remain in the condition in which he was called. Verse 21, were you a bond servant when called? Are you a slave in Roman society? Do not be concerned about it. Sorry, what, Apostle Paul? Do not be concerned about it, because this life is a vapor, and it's going to be over like that. Your concern, your focus is on heaven. Our mind is to be set on heavenly things, not overthrowing society. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. Oh, parentheses, but, but, says the Apostle Paul, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. If there's a way to get your freedom, and I've, I've mentioned there were certain ways you could earn your master's trust, you could be released. Uh, you may even, because slaves did earn a little bit of money, you could perhaps save enough to purchase your freedom, which is basically saying, uh, I have this amount of money, uh, master, it's enough for a new slave, so he'll let you go free because you're probably old and used up and he'll just buy a replacement for you, but at least you're free. There were ways of becoming free. If you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of the opportunity. But that's secondary. Here, it's in brackets for me, verse 22. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant, you may be a slave here and now in the world, but you are a freed man in the Lord. Remember the spiritual reality by which you now walk and live. The spiritual reality is that you are free. Even the most base Chained slave, if he be in Christ, if she be in Christ, is free in every sense that it really counts. 
Likewise, he who is free when he is called is a bondservant of Christ. Maybe you are a free Roman citizen. You have all these rights that the talking tools don't. You become a Christian. Guess what? You're now a slave. We're all, Paul is saying, slaves. You were bought, verse 23, you were bought with a price. Every town, every sizable community in the Roman Empire had a slave market. The, two, the biggest one was in Rome. Thousands, hundreds, and thousands sometimes of people made in the image of God would be sold as property. And incidentally, one of the things I know that we, we hear this and we think of slavery and our minds go back about 150 years, 200 years to antebellum South America, so the southern states, um, which was terrible. The Bible does not condone that. It, it's very interesting to see in the lead up to the American Civil War how this issue was addressed from pulpits. But it's important for us, one of the things that differentiates Greco-Roman slavery from the slavery that's closer to us in history is that Greco-Roman slavery is not racially picky. Uh, they'll enslave anybody. In fact, when Rome went to war and captured Franks or Germans or Jews or North Africans, it didn't matter what your skin was, you could be pressed into service and slavery. They would take anyone. They would enslave anyone. But there's a reminder that if you are slave or free and you're in Christ, you're now all slaves. You are bond servants, bought with a price. Just as I could go to any place in the Roman Empire with a sack full of money and buy a slave, in the same way, there was a slave market and you were bought out of it. Paul's using, like Jesus does in his parables, something very every day and showing you the spiritual reality it's speaking to. There was a slave market of sin. And you were wearing its chains. And Christ came and said, I'll take that one. And the chains fell off and Christ purchased you. Not with gold, not with silver, but with his own shed blood. He paid the price for you, believer, and he took you by the hand. And just as you would purchase a slave in the slave market of the first century Greco-Roman world, I bought that person, they're now mine. That is the relationship of every believer to Christ. He owns us. We are his. You were bought with a price. Do not become bond servants of men. Don't work to please men. Don't put the praise and glory of men as your ultimate goal. No matter what your lot in life, no matter where you are, no matter what your job is, whether you're working in the city or out in the fields, you don't work in the grand spiritual truth reality of things. You don't work for your owner. You don't work for your boss. You don't work for your company, your corporation. You don't belong to them. You belong to Christ. So who do you work for? And when you come to that reality, it colors everything, all facets, all aspects of your life, your marriage, your family, your partnership, your thought, your speech, and your workplace in, as we would say, in 21st century Canada, but your station in the Roman Empire here originally wrought. You were bought with a price, so don't become bond servants of men. So, brothers, in whatever condition each was called, let him remain with God. We were all slaves to sin before we were purchased. Now we are slaves to righteousness. We are, as Paul describes himself, slaves to Christ. We are his. He is our master. We do what he says. Now, we do this out of dour obligation? No. Back to our main text. Obey your earthly masters with a sincere heart. Not as, these are very interesting terms here, not as people pleasers. This is the only time in the Bible this is used. Uh, this and Corinthians, or um, not Corinthians, Colossians, where it's pretty much the same text. Not as people pleasers. Uh, what is that? Uh, that's uh, bosses come and everybody look busy. 
Uh, I only work well when the master's eye is on me. This is why employers put cameras in the workplace <laughs> now. Somebody's always watching. Well, uh, well if they're watching, I'm, I'm really going to work well. Don't do that. That insinuates you're slacking off whenever the master's eye, he, if he leaves, everybody takes it easy? No. Not as people pleasers. Uh, that's, sorry, that's eye service. People pleasers is the longest same thing. People pleasers would be, uh, if eye service is I only work hard when somebody's actually looking in my direction, people pleasers is the opposite end of the spectrum. It's just as bad. This is the suck up. This is the boot liquor. This is the sycophant. More coffee, boss? You've all been in office workplaces. I mean, you've met everybody. You, maybe this has been you on one end of this spectrum. That's not how you work, 21st century Canada. That's not how you navigate your life as a slave, first century Rome. You don't just work hard when the master's in view. And you don't suck up to him because he's ultimately not your true master. You navigate all of this through life knowing that you are a slave, yes, but you are a slave to Christ. And he is a good, good master. And he put such worth on you. He desired to have you for his own to such a degree that he stood in your place, he hung in your place on the cross of Calvary and purchased you not with silver or gold, or denarii, and not for as long as you are useful to him either. He purchased you with his own blood, and he purchased you forever. And in the light of forever, let me tell you, in the light and remembrance of forever, a lot of things in this world become a lot easier to bear. This light, momentary affliction that is our life. So, are you a bond servant? Remain a bond servant. Your station doesn't change. What changes is your attitude. What has changed now is you. You were dead in your sins and trespasses. Now you are alive in Christ. So remain in your station and do it, whatever it may be, as one who is alive in Christ, so that Christ may be seen in you. You see? That doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It may even be pleasant. Sometimes picking up your cross and following Jesus is exactly that. You will die. And incidentally, because slaves were the lowest of the low and had no rights and were property and chattel and talking tools, they are the ones who suffer crucifixion because that's the worst thing that the Roman Empire can possibly come up with. Roman citizens cannot be crucified. It's in the law. That's why Paul was likely beheaded. And Peter was crucified. He didn't have those rights. Crucifixion is so deplorable, we don't talk about it in polite society here in Rome, here in Ephesus. We don't talk about it. Who suffers crucifixion? Thieves? Certain prisoners of war? Slaves. Who cares about them? Christ cares about them. And masters... You are to care about them just as the same as Christ does. You see how this is countercultural now? You see how this is completely shocking? This is upending. Paul doesn't have to, the Bible doesn't have to call for an end to slavery, as evil as it is, as repugnant as it is. And let's be very clear this morning it's evil and repugnant, biblically, because you are taking people. Living, breathing souls, made in the image of God, carrying the image of God, and of such worth and value to God that he sent his only begotten son to die in their place that they might come to re repentance, belief, and salvation. They're so precious to him, you're taking that which is precious to the Lord and you're treating it as property. He takes a dim view of that, to say the least. You're not celebrating the imago Dei, the image of God. You are, in fact, debasing it. The Bible in no way supports that. But the Bible is not primarily concerned with this life on earth, is it? It's preparing us for heaven. It's showing us how to be kingdom representatives and ambassadors. It's showing us how, no matter what walk of life you may come from, 
no matter what strata of society you may occupy, you're all equal here when we open this letter from the Apostle Paul. You submit to one another. Here's the countercultural, mind-baffling thing I told you a couple of weeks ago. Wives, submit to your husbands. And there's many smug husbands at the church of Ephesus going, do you hear that? Pay attention. Pay attention. Submit. I've been telling her to submit for years. Husbands, sacrificially love your wives. Sorry, what? You submit to your wife through your labor, through your sacrifice, through your care, through your protection. Children, listen up, kids. This one's for you. Children, obey your parents. Yes. Yes, Paul. You tell them. Parents, do not overly discipline your children. Sorry, what? Parents, you submit to your children with the example you give them, with the Christ-likeness you exemplify. What? That's not how the world works, Paul. And if he were here, he would say, yes, I know. Because we're not no longer citizens in this world, are we? We're just passing through. So here we come to this issue. Part of the household, part of everyday society. I mean, it's absolutely rampant. 20 to 30% of the people that you meet every day are owned by other people. Don't worry about this earthly life so much as worry about your identity in Christ. Whether you are slave or master, you're actually all equal now. And you submit to one another equally. So if it's topsy-turvy and world-shaking to think about husbands submitting to their wives sacrificially and parents submitting to their children through the example they set, imagine what happens when we get to, here's what the Christian life practically looks like in contrast to the world Masters, submit to your slaves. Come again? How do I do that? By treating them not as property, but as brothers. Try to find with me, if you would, the very tiny letter of Philemon. If you find Hebrews, you've gone too far. This is, in my Bible, it's one page, and it's kind of generously spread out to fill the whole page. A very short letter. Uh, someday I will tell you more and more about the, the relationship between Philemon and Colossians. It's absolutely fascinating. Between these two letters, we, uh, we get a, a, an, an inkling into a very fascinating thing that's happening. So this is part of the letter to the Church of Colossae. Let me just say that. They arrived together. And between the two of them, we know something about the Church of Colossae. It's a home church, and it is in the home of Philemon. He owns a space big enough for all the Christians to come and gather. Uh, so he owns a house, he owns property, he's doing very well in terms of life, which means he owns slaves. Right? He's got at least a couple of them. He has at least one of them, we know. Uh, if he's very affluent, I've said he could maybe own a hundred. Paul writes a letter to the church at Colossae, and then he sends this as an addendum. And this, too, would have been read out loud. You're going to love this letter if you've never come to this. It's beautiful. So here's, you need to know the backstory before we come to the text, right? And, and again, we glean the backstory between the two. So Philemon is a wealthy, very prosperous. He's doing very well in terms of the Roman Empire. He's got a wife. Uh, her name is Aphia. He has a, probably the, his son here, Archippus. And Archippus is actually the pastor of this home church. So it's a family with a home church, and they, they welcome everyone. They're slaves. There's maybe some freed men. there be some free citizens in there as well. It's a real mixture, melange. It's the family of God gathered under Philemon's house. Now, something has happened, and this comes before the writing of Colossians, all right? One of Philemon's slaves, Onesimus, has, we don't have all the details, but you can suss out the clues, He's stolen from the master. And let me tell you, he's a dead man. He's a dead man. He's at least going to earn a, a beating for this. Philemon has a slave named Onesimus. Onesimus has taken some money, we think. He's taken some money, probably enough to start a new life, and he's fled to Rome. Because there's a million people in Rome, and it's really easy to get lost. Nobody knows me. Nobody will find me. And by the way, uh, incidentally, slave hunting is a big part of life in the Roman Empire. 
If you were caught, you would actually be branded with a collar, a slave collar, and in Latin around it, it would say, I am a slave, please do not help me. Because if you were complicit in helping, aiding and abetting an escaped slave, there were punishments for you as well. So Philemon has taken some money, takes money to start a new life, and I go to Rome. I got away, I did it, I'm free and clear. And then he runs into the apostle Paul. If you don't believe in providence, this is, these are two letters about providence. In a city of a million people, he runs into the apostle Paul. He hears the gospel from Paul. He becomes a Christian. He starts living and working and helping Paul. He hears this story. Now, so Paul and Winesimus are now in Rome. Great. One day, a representative from Colossae, from this very household church from which Onesimus fled, he comes to Rome because the church at Colossae is having some problems. He goes, there's only one guy I can think of I will, who, who can answer, who can help us. I'll go to Rome and find the Apostle Paul. So a representative from Colossae goes a thousand miles to Rome, finds Paul, and oh, hey, look who's here. I know you, Onesimus. Paul gets filled in with the whole backstory. Paul writes the letter to the church of Colossae. And then he writes this little letter to the man who owns the house in which the church meets. And then he sends everybody back to Colossae, including Philemon. So that's the very, very colorful background to Philemon. So here's the little letter that gets written to a slave owner. And it's basically this. Dear Philemon, I found your slave. Here he is back again. You know what to do. Love Paul. All right. That's the Coles Stones version. What does he actually say? Philemon. And you'll note it's only one chapter. Take a look at verse 8. And when Nisimus, keep in mind, is a thief. He has stolen from his master. Under Roman law, Philemon is absolutely within his rights to pick up an axe handle and beat this guy. Breaking limbs, maybe kill him. And no one in the house, legally, in terms of the world, would bat an eye. Well, I mean, they would bat an eye because they're all Christians, but legally, culturally, they shouldn't. This is the world in which we live in. So Paul sends Winesimus back. There's a very good chance that Philemon will exercise his rights as a Roman citizen and kill him. And hence in the letter, Paul at verse 8 says, Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. Paul says, I know what the law says you're able to do. I'm not talking about you as a Roman citizen. I'm talking to you, Philemon, as a brother in Christ. And as a brother in Christ, with a regenerate heart, when you look on your prodigal son here, you'll know what to do. But in case it's not clear, let me clarify it for you. I appeal to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I became in imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but he is indeed now useful to you and me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. Gets that little gospel reminder in there. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent. See, Paul recognizes that Onesimus, yes, technically in terms of the world, your property, and I can't make the final call because you don't belong to me, you belong to Philemon. So I'm going to send you back to Philemon to answer for it. But I also know that Philemon is a brother in Christ, and so are you. And so the way that you are received when you come back at long last to this household, which you have stolen from, should be very, very different than it would if either of you were unregenerate. You see? Verse 15, for this is perhaps why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. Verse 16, no longer a slave, but a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in flesh and in the Lord. So if you, Philemon, consider me, the Apostle Paul, your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, read aloud before the whole congregation, I, Paul, write this with my own hand, I will repay it. Oh, to say nothing of your owing me for your own self. Remember who led you to Christ and the inheritance of heaven's riches. See, Paul says, set him free. 
You have no choice. If you are in Christ, finally, if you are a representative of the kingdom of heaven and someone who has wronged you, someone whom the world says is your property comes home, if you're in Christ and he's in Christ, you're both in Christ. You're both slaves. You're both brothers. You've both been equally purchased. He says, when you consider who you are, Philemon, and who he is, the answer is obvious. Set him free. Now keep in mind, this is a household. There may be dozens. There could be dozens and dozens of slaves. Oh, and also the congregation's gathered, right? Everybody's watching. When the bearer of this letter walks in, they're like, oh, good, he's, he's back. Oh, oh, that, that, that's one SMS. Oh, it's going down. Now, we don't know what happened. There are some anecdotes from later in church history where a bishop of the church at Colossae named Onesimus is entered into the record. We believe that Philemon's conversion was general and, or genuine, rather, and he did do the right thing. Look, that is just to say that the Bible does not condone slavery. But the Bible's primary concern is not societal overhaul. You see? That is a secondary outflowing of gospel transformation. And that's what the Bible is concerned about. That's what our whole study has been about. Are you transformed? Are we a transformed people? Paul says in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? I know it sounds ridiculous. I know the world hates it. I know people scoff at it. I know it's, it, to put it even into words, sounds ridiculous. That this Jew from nowhere was in fact God in the flesh who died on your behalf, who was dead for three days, rose on the third day, is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. I know how ridiculous it seems, and nevertheless, I am unashamed of it. Why? Because it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believes. It is the gospel's transformative power that is our concern here. That is Paul's concern here. And if we are genuine Christians, no matter what our station in life, if we are transformed, then that expresses itself through everything we do, how we think, what we speak, who we partner with, how we worship, who we marry, how we raise our children, how we treat those we are either under or who are under us. You think, oh, well, it's a bit of a leap, Braden, to go from owning slaves to the workplace. Really. You think the uh, attitude of the world towards the boss is any different? I, I kind of debated whether or not this is, uh, but let me give you this. I think this sums up our more contemporary wor attitude towards work. This little poem here. The foreman, he's a regular dog. The line boss, he's a fool. He got a brand new flat top haircut. Lord, he thinks he's cool. One of these days, I'm going to blow my top. And that sucker, he's going to pay. Lord, I can't wait to see their faces when I get the nerve to say, take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. My woman done left and took all the reasons I was working for. You better not try and stand in my way as I'm walking out the door. Take this job and shove it. I ain't working here no more. You know, uh, this was written by the appropriately named Johnny Paycheck. In 1977, it topped the charts for two weeks. It was his only number one hit. You know why it's so popular? Because this puts into twangy country verb and rhyme the dream of every contemporary worker. I can't wait to win the lottery. Boy, if I go home and, and find that lost $70 million lottery ticket, come Monday morning, the sparks are going to fly here. I won't have to care anymore what my boss thinks. I won't have to work for anybody. I'm just going to tell everybody off. I'm out of here. I'll be free. I'll be free. Well, Charles Hodge, writing in 1860, Surmise the way that we should approach these verses, I think, very, very well. Quote, in this world, some men are masters and some men are slaves. In the next, these distinctions will cease. Let me pause right there. 
The church and our relationships to one another is supposed to be reflective of the world to come. Do you understand? Which means that all distinctions in the world cease when we gather and are in one another's lives. So, Charles Hodge finishes with this. Quote, the question there in the world to come, the question there will be not who is the master and who is the slave. The question will be who has done the will of God, close quote. Who will be able to stand before the throne of God and say, I exemplified you as best I could wherever I was at all points. In the workplace, even though I was the lowest of the low in society, even though I was talking property, nevertheless, I represented my true master in heaven. And through that representation, perhaps I led my master to see Christ in me and come there himself. And if I was a slave owner, if I was a master, you will likewise answer at the end of life before the throne of God, and the question will be, how did you treat the least of these who were mine? You want to be able to say, I treated them as if they were you. I treated them as if they were my own beloved children. I treated them fairly, lavishly, with mercy and with generosity. I wasn't just in it to squeeze them dry so that I could earn more profit on the quarterly report. Whether we are workers, whether we are employers, whether we are in this instance slaves or slave owners, the focus of this text, the focus of the Bible and its counterculturalism is revealed in the fact that we're all slaves of Christ. We're all representatives of Christ. Whether it's in first century Ephesus, whether it's in 21st century Canada, and this is why the Bible doesn't overly concern itself with overturning societies because societies change. But Christ's people are the same no matter where they are found. It's the great unifier. So here, as we apply these verses, not to slave ownership or slave mastery, but to the workplace, to either working in it or owning it and running it, it's all the same. We will answer before Christ for how we conducted ourselves and how we represented him. And in him, you'll see at the end, there is no impartiality. Everybody's equal. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. All of us will someday, I know I'm way over, just, I want to leave you with this, this beautiful one. Do we know the name John Newton? Amazing grace, he wrote. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Do you know about John Newton? Did you know that for years he was a sea captain in the, the transatlantic slave trade? He transported people from the parts of Africa to the New World many, many, many times. And then during a storm off the kind of north coast of Ireland that almost sank him, uh, it's usually, it's sometimes, some men need that kind of fear shock into them. And he became a believer. And the more he became a believer, he realized, I can't do this anymore. You see, he was totally comfortable doing it, making a great deal of money. But when Christ came in and transformed him, when he became indwelt by the Holy Spirit, suddenly he looks at his entire life and goes, these two things don't match anymore. I can't do this as I used to. I have to do it differently. So eventually he became a leading voice in the abolition movement. He wrote this, speaking of himself, and these should be our words as well, quote, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But I still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am, close quote, John Newton, always moving forward my hearers. No matter the time, no matter the place, no matter the circumstances, always moving forward, always exemplifying Christ. Always looking forward to eternity rather than being bogged down and mired by the here and now. God, our Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for 
the opportunity to come to this difficult passage, difficult because we want to look at it through a, a distorted historic socio lens. Thank you for the opportunity to, I pray, clarify it and come to the heart of the matter, to not be distracted by, by anything except the need for gospel transformation in all the people of the world. Lord, whatever our lot is in life, whether we have been given little or given much, whether we are rulers over much or rulers over very little, maybe even none, help us to be happy. Help us to look forward to eternity. Help us not to get distracted by the calls for revolution, but help us to focus on heaven where our real inheritance is. Lord, let us be equitable in all our dealings with all people, displaying the fruits of the Spirit and exemplifying Christ, that if we have teams of employees underneath us, that we would treat them as if they were our own beloved brothers and sisters and indeed even our children. Help us to exemplify mercy and grace and fairness to them. And if we are employees and have those over us, help us to be good Christ-exemplifying workers, not eye-service people-pleasers, not working and then disparaging the boss, not being hypocritical, but being as Christ has called us to be, as your word has called us to be. Help keep us focused on eternity and help us live as transformed, gospel-centered, revitalized, born-again people in all we say and do, not just when we gather for worship, but whether we are at home as we sang or in the throng, whether we are alone with you in prayer or in the midst of our families. We pray that we would be ever more like Christ, content, peaceful, and evangelistic. We pray all these things in the Savior's name. Lord, help us through these difficult, dark days in which we live. Help us to cross the finish line. Amen.